I come from uh, an area in the United States. Uh, it's called the state of Rhode Island. Uh, it's the most Catholic state in the United States. Seventy percent of the population were born in the Catholic Church. As I grew up, it was like growing up in Poland. Everybody was Catholic. And I know in this country you've seen a lot of people stop coming to Mass. But it's much more severe where we are in the United States. We're down to 20 to 25 percent of the Catholics go to Mass on Sunday. Where it was easy to be a Catholic all of my life growing up. For my grandchildren now, it's much more difficult to be Catholic. Most of their friends don't go to church anymore. And it, it has an effect on how we think about who we are. So I want to encourage you because your Poland is not as bad as the United States right now. You want to reverse the way things are going. Get it back to the way it used to be. Where 90% of all Catholics go to church every Sunday. We make little choices every day. And when these choices accumulate over time, it really affects how we live as Catholics. And we need to make good Catholic decisions every single day of our lives. Life is a series of choices. We chose to come out and come here tonight. There are 2,500 choices we make every single day. Some of them are very big decisions, some of them are very small. But what we choose today is going to affect our future. You even choose your, your thoughts every day. All the things that we're dwelling on are the things that we choose to dwell on. We choose our attitudes, whether we're going to be in a good mood or a bad mood. You choose who you're going to associate with. And as Catholics, we need to make decisions to choose the right Catholic things in our lives. We have to choose to make Catholic decisions and think about Catholic things. Because we choose what we watch on television or what we listen to on the radio. We even choose our own self-image, what we think of ourselves. Whether you realize it or not, you're making hundreds of important decisions every day. And these decisions determine our destiny. You are what you are today because of the choices you've made in the past. And you will be in the future what you are making decisions for today. So the quality of your life is determined by the quality of the decisions that you make. Jakość twojego życia zależy od decyzji, od tego, jak się twoje decyzje. 
We need to make wise choices for our lives. Musimy podejmować mądre wybory dla naszego życia. So God has a great plan for all of us in our lives. Więc Bóg ma wspaniały plan dla każdego z nas i dla każdego z naszego poszczególnego życia. God really has made a purpose for your life. Bóg naprawdę ma cel dla waszego życia. Jeremiah says, God, I saw you when you were in your mother's womb, in your mother's womb. And he planned all your days for good and not for evil. And in Ephesians 2.10 it says, God predestined us. So God has planned ahead of time that we would have a good life. We're supposed to be enjoying our time here. St. Paul says, God has planned for us to do even more than we could ever imagine. Behind our highest hopes and dreams, he's planned these good things for us. I can tell you with great confidence today that God has a wonderful plan for each of your lives. It doesn't matter what's happened to you in your past or what you're going through right now. God wants this year to be the very best year of your life. Now you might say, if God has all these wonderful plans for me, why have so many bad things happened to me? Some of you may have sickness in your family, or you're in debt, or have other problems. It all has to do with the choices we've made. Because God's will for us is to have victory in our lives. But we need to make wise decisions to get there. Our decisions have to line up with God's word. In 2 Peter it says this. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God's will is that nobody should perish. But we know that people are perishing. Because they're not making wise decisions. In Deuteronomy it says this. I have set before you life and death. Blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life. He's telling us, I'll give you whatever you choose. But he's encouraging us to choose good things, choose life. We control our destiny through the choices we make. And the choices always control the chooser. See, if you make a choice not to forgive someone, then your unforgiveness will control you. It'll poison your life. <coughs> if you choose self-pity, self-pity will start to control your life. If you choose loose morals, lust will control you. If you choose to be around people that are ungodly, you're not going to receive what God has, the best things God has for you. 
So your choices control the chooser. But on the other hand, if you obey God and His Word, and you're living a life of love, you have a good attitude, you want to do good to others, then all of these positive choices, they're going to dominate you and cause you to have victory in your life. So we want to stop choosing faith rather than fear. Choose happiness rather than depression. Success rather than failure. Start having a good attitude about your life. And don't walk around angry all the time and hurt. You know, it's so simple. We think, oh, you mean I can make a choice to be happy? Absolutely. It's as simple as that. God didn't make it so only the very intelligent are going to be happy. Or well, the very rich should be only happy people. No, it's the people that know the truth about what God has for us. God says He wants to have good and not evil in our lives. If we really believe that, we choose it. And if we choose it because God said it, it's going to happen in our lives. He didn't say we're going to be happy every day of our lives, every moment of our lives. We cannot be always happy every moment of our lives. But we know in, inside that God has happiness for us. Stop making choices that lead to a holy, godly life. The only person that can hold you back from your destiny is you. The problem is we don't want to change. We don't want to crucify our flesh. There's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. And we have to make choices whether we're going to let the flesh rule or we're going to let the spirit rule our lives. See, the flesh never wants to change. It's selfish and self-centered. It wants to gossip about people. It wants to be critical. We always want to be judgmental and satisfy all our lustful cravings. If you're driving down the street, this is more for men than women. If you're driving down the street and someone cuts you off, you want to drive after them and yell at them and scream at them. Now the women may not want to do that so much. But as men, we want to get back at them. See, our flesh always wants to be angry and upset all the time. It's natural for the body to want that. The flesh is very lazy. On Sunday morning, we want to roll over. Oh, we don't have to get up to church. And you think, oh, I worked hard all week. I can stay in bed today. They have a wonderful mass on television. I'll watch mass on television. <coughs> the flesh always wants to gratify itself. I heard about this man that was like that. He was in bed on Sunday morning. 
And his mother came in and said, Get up, it's time to go to church. And he just rolled over and went back to sleep. A few minutes later, she came back in again and said, Come on now, get up, it's time to go to church. Again, he rolled over and go back to sleep. So the third time his mother came in and ripped the clothes off and put the shades up and says, Come on now, it's time to get up. He said, Mom, give me three good reasons I should get up. She said, First, it's Sunday, you should get up and go to church. Second, you're 37 years old, you should be doing this. And third, you're a priest and you're supposed to be saying mass now. The flesh always wants us to stay in bed. The flesh always wants to take the easy way out. But the Holy Spirit will tell us to do the right thing. The Holy Spirit is called a counselor. One of his main functions is to lead and guide us. To help us to make the right decisions in our lives. And the Holy Spirit will function through our conscience. It's an inner feeling we receive. Just an inside impression the Holy Spirit gives us. It's not necessarily in our heads, it's more in our hearts. See, God's Spirit speaks to our spirit, not to our mind. And your conscience functions as the uh, response to your spirit. And your conscience is a function not so much of your mind as it is of your heart. <coughs> See, everyone has a conscience, but without the quickening of the spirit, our conscience lies dormant. In 1 John 3 it says this. Behold, if your conscience does not accuse, accuse us and make us feel guilty, then we have confidence with God. If our conscience isn't bothering us, that means the Holy Spirit is leading us in that direction. So when we say God speaks to our spirit, and God speaks to our heart, we could actually be saying that God speaks through our conscience. Because in Galatians 5 it says this, if you will be led and controlled by the Spirit, then you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You could say if you're being, if you're heed the warnings of your conscience, you will not go against your inner impressions then you will make right decisions and stay in God's best path for you. Remember, your choices determine your destiny. See, God is trying to lead you and keep you on the right path. But we need to heed that inner warning with the Spirit speaking to us. He warns us to stay in the right path. 
No, dlatego też musimy brać pod uwagę te wewnętrzne ostrzeżenia, które Bóg nam daje, abyśmy pozostali na tej słusznie, słusznej drodze. Don't override your conscience. Nie zagłuszajcie swojego sumienia. One of the functions of our conscience is to make us feel uncomfortable when we're not doing the right thing. Jednym z zadań naszego sumienia jest to, aby się czuli niedobrze wtedy, kiedy robimy coś nieodpowiedniego. So we need to be sensitive to the leading of the spirit that's going on in us. Więc musimy być wrażliwi i posłuszni temu, co Duch Święty, jak Duch Święty działa w nas. If you ignore the spirit, you'll get a guilty conscience. Jeśli nie będziesz ignorował ducha, to wtedy będziesz miał winne sumienie. So I want to challenge you to make wise decisions. Więc chcę wam wrócić wyzwania, abyście podejmowali dobre decyzje. On a daily basis, think about what God is leading you to do. W rytmie codziennym, abyście słuchali tego, co Bóg sam byście robili. Don't gratify the flesh, but be led by the Holy Spirit. Spełniajcie zawsze ciało, ale dajcie się prowadzić duchowi. Don't be a compromiser. Nie bądźcie tym, który cały czas nie ma kompromis. Don't have the attitude, oh, I'll just get by with your life. Nie miejcie takiego nastawienia, że jakoś, jak to zawsze będzie. What can I, what's the minimum I can do and still get to heaven someday? Nie myślcie w ten sposób, że jak jest... Co jest, co jest tym minimum, żeby kiedyś pewnego dnia się dostał do nieba? See, we are not here to get to heaven. Słuchajcie, my nie jesteśmy po to, aby się dostać do nieba. We are here to bring heaven down to earth. My jesteśmy tutaj po to, aby niebo wstąpiło na ziemię. That's what it means to have a Christian witness. To znaczy mieć świadectwo chrześcijańskie. To bring God's presence to the rest of the world that doesn't know Him. Aby przyciągnąć obecność Bożą do reszty świata, która so, nie zna. So if you're always just trying to get by and just do the very minimum you can in order to get to Więc jeśli cały czas robisz tylko to, żeby było jako tako i cały czas robisz tylko minimum, you're not going to be comfortable with yourself. To nie będzie ci dobrze samemu z sobą. And you're not going to be encouraging others to come to know Jesus. I też nie będziesz zachęcał też innych, aby chcieli poznać Jezusa. Make pleasing the Lord your highest priority in your life. Uczysz się Boga tym, że wybierzesz najwyższe priorytet w swoim życiu. Jego jako najwyższe priorytet w swoim życiu. God has predestined you for greatness. Bo Bóg przeznaczył cię dla wspaniałości. He has predestined you for a life of victory. On cię przeznaczył do życia we wspaniałości, w zwycięstwie. If you make wise choices on a daily basis, jeśli codziennie będziesz podejmował mądre decyzje. God will take you places you never dreamed of. You can live the abundant life that He has in store for you. God left us His word in the Bible. Now all religious people will tell you, read the Bible, read the Bible. It's not so that we can be very smart and memorize all these words. It's so that God's truth is revealed to our hearts. And when you read His Word, you get convinced that God has a wonderful life in store for us. Wtedy to nas przekona do tego, że Bóg ma w zanadrzu wspaniałe życie dla nas. He tells us that over and over again in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I on to bez przerwy powtarza i powtarza w Starym Testamencie i w Nowym Testamencie. And if you read that word and believe that word, jeśli będziecie czytać to słowo i wierzyć w to słowo, your spirit gets convinced to that, to wtedy wasz duch się przekona o tym. You start making wise choices for your life. And the abundant life that God has promised to His people comes to you. You are the only one that can hold you back from an abundant life. Now the devil is there to tempt you. That's his job. And you, we're not going to take his job away from him. He's always going to be there to tempt you. But when you get a promise from God, what, what the devil does is test those promises. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, the Spirit of God came on him in the form of a dove. 
And he heard the father's voice saying, this is my beloved son. So that was the great promise that Jesus got. He is the beloved son of the father. Once he heard that word, it said the spirit of God burned to the desert and tested to jest napisane, że y, tu wyprowadził Jezusa na pustyni, gdzie what, był podległy gdzie był podległy uczeniu. What did he test? He tested that word that he was the beloved son of God. Jest co potestowane, czy podawane próbie, no właśnie słowo, które wypowiedział Bóg. So we're always being tested whether we believe God wants this wonderful life for us too. Więc zawsze będziemy podawali próbie odnośnie tych obietnic, które dla nas ma, że chce dla nas od tego życia. Are you really the adopted sons and daughters of your father in heaven? Can you believe that you are genuinely an adopted son or daughter of the father in heaven? Now, if your father owned the entire universe, What would you have to worry about? <coughs> if, your, if your brother Jesus healed thousands of people, why are you worried about sickness? When we come to believe who we are in Christ, everything changes. We start to make choices that God tells us to make. Więc wtedy zaczynamy podejmować decyzje, które Bóg mówi, żebyśmy podejmowali. But we need to read the word of God and understand it. Ale musimy zacząć czytać Słowo Boże i rozumieć je. And once we understand it, i gdy tylko je zrozumiemy, we believe it's for you and me. Wtedy uwierzymy w mnie, ja i ty. It's a personal word written to you. To jest osobiste Słowo, napisane to dla ciebie. His son, his daughter, you. Dla ciebie. And his word consistently says, I have a full and abundant life for you. I give you peace, not as the world gives you peace, but they give us a heavenly peace. So the most important choice we have to make now więc najważniejszy wybór, jaki teraz musimy dokonać, is to believe what God tells us in His Word. Uwierzyć w to, co Bóg mówi w swoim słowie. We believe that, we respond to that. Gdy uwierzymy w to i odpowiemy na to, and God will fill you with peace, love, and joy. To Bóg napełni ciebie pokojem, miłością i radością. The Word of God says, believe and receive. Słowo Boże mówi, uwierz i przyjmij. It's your choice. To jest twój wybór. What do you want to believe? Więc w co chcesz uwierzyć? What the world and the devil tells you? To, co świat mówi ci i to, co diabeł ci mówi? What do you want to believe what the word of God tells us? Czy chcesz uwierzyć w to, co Słowo Boże mówi tobie? This is why it's important that we have the support of many Catholics around us. Dlatego jest to tak strasznie ważne, abyśmy mieli wsparcie katolików dookoła siebie. I've seen the dramatic change in the last 50 years in the United States where I live. Widziałem bardzo dramatyczną zmianę w Ameryce w ciągu ostatnich 50 lat. Where everyone seemed to believe in the Catholic Church. Gdzie tak było, że wszyscy sprawiali wrażenie, że wierzą w Kościele katolickim. Now most of the people don't believe. A teraz większość ludzi w ogóle nie wierzy. They even say they're Catholic still, but they don't believe. Może czasami mówią, że są katolikami, ale wcale nie wierzą. Poland is very close behind us. Polska jest wypełcza na powietrze. And I'm encouraging you I ja was zachęcam to take the responsibility aby wziąć odpowiedzialność to turn this back around aby to odwrócić. And be an example of what it is to believe in God. I bądźcie przykładem tego, co to znaczy wierzyć w Boga. You don't have to stand on the street corner and preach the gospel. Nie musicie stać na rogu ulicy i głosić Ewangelię. You just have to really believe what God tells you. Wystarczy, jak naprawdę uwierzycie w to, co Bóg mówi do was. And the word says that we will be a light to the nations. A Bóg mówi, 
Let the light of God shine through you. Więc niech światło Boże świeci przez Ciebie. By believing His promises to you. Poprzez to, że uwierzysz w obietnicę, która ma dla Ciebie. In Jesus' name I pray. I modlę się w imię Jego Sam. What are we seeing? Powstańmy. Father God, I ask that you would pour out the grace into our hearts. That we would believe your word more than we believe our circumstances. That we would be committed to you and your ways more than the world. That our hearts would leap for joy in knowing you every day in prayer. And that your Eucharist would penetrate our hearts and our minds as we receive it. And that you would transform us into the image and likeness of your Son, Jesus. Amen. 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 If you evangelize the father, 97% of the families will come to church with him. And we are all called to be evangelists. That's our first and basic call as Catholics. And so I see it like i don't want, it isn't that it's a waste of time evangelizing women or children. <coughs> But if we can evangelize fathers, we bring the whole family, women and children, to, the, to Jesus. 
że rolnik może zawarnizujemy ojców, to wtedy przyprowadzi na nasze całe rodziny do kościoła. And one of the major problems with men is they don't have fellowship. I głównym problemem z mężczyznami jest to, że oni nie mają ze sobą wspólnoty. Women have a tendency to be, have the ability to relate to each other in an easier way about God. Kobiety są dużo łatwiej odnosić się do siebie i otwierać swoje swoje przeżycia związane z Bogiem. Men, men have a difficulty in sharing their personal life in, in Christ. So we, I tried to set up systems where men can come to know Jesus and to have good fellowship with other men. Because the attitude for a lot of men is churches for women and children, they need to be around where there's just men around them so they feel comfortable again. So we, I have a system of where we have men's meeting either once a month or every week. The men will come together for two hours. In, it, it doesn't even have to be in the church. It can be in a hall anywhere. We use the book Signpost, which has been translated into Polish. Where there's a reading from Scripture and a reading from the Catechism. And six discussion questions that the men can share about. And we, we may come together as a larger group and do the readings together. But then we break down the groups of six to eight men in a little group so we can have discussions about questions. Because my experience is most Catholics have never read the whole Bible. And even more, most Catholics have never read any part of the Catechism. So these teachings give a little taste of what it is to know the Bible and the Catechism. But men don't want to approach life just academically through, uh, through their brains only. They want to be able to have fellowship at the same time. So the men's meetings are set up so that men start to feel more and more comfortable around the Bible, around the Catechism, and with each other. Now, most men's ministries that I know about in the Catholic Church, have been men coming together to paint the basement of the church or to raise some money and do something good for the church. But the men of St. Joseph is focused on a personal relationship with Jesus. Nothing is more important than a personal relationship with Jesus and good fellowship with other men. When you bring men to that relationship, they'll do work in the church, but their first and most important thing is that relationship with Jesus. And going to Sunday Mass once a week for one hour will not do it for most men. Most men don't know how to pray. 
they may know some rote prayers, Hail Mary, the Our Father, but they don't really know how to pray. And so some of these men's meetings gets to we talk about prayer, we talk about all these different subjects. Because we're losing Christianity in the Western world. Most men don't even know how to raise a family anymore. So we teach a little about how to come into a family relationship in Christ. And it's very important that the men be alone sometimes without women around them to learn these things. And, and, and we are making an attempt to do this around the world right now. Kardinal Dziwicz asked me to go to Rome and to set up an international men's ministry. And we're in the process of doing that right now. It's really critical that you pray that men's ministry rise up in the Catholic Church. Because in the Western world we're losing our place of influence. Because we're becoming a minority instead of the majority. Places like England and France, a very small percentage of Catholics even go to church now. And when you lose the culture of Christianity or Catholicism, it'll take centuries to regain them. This is still a Catholic country. 20 years from now, I'm not sure. It may be a pagan nation. I never would have believed when I was a boy growing up that the United States would be in the place it's in right now. It doesn't take long to lose Christianity. And it's the responsibility of the men more than anyone else to bring it back. I can talk about ladies too. What? I can talk about ladies if you want. Lives of the saints. 
reading, reading the lives of the saints. There, there are hundreds of good books on prayer that you, you kind of have to be ready for. You know, and just at the more mature you get, the more you want to read deeper things on prayer. When you make sure you read good Catholic literature, especially on prayer, because there's lots of very unhealthy teachings on prayer. Lots of new age has creeped into the Catholic Church, and you want to stay clear of that. Dużo New Age'u dostało się w nasze katolickie myślenie i tutaj też to chciałem właśnie podkreślić. All you have to do is just what Jesus did. That's all you have to do. Po to, co musicie robić, to jest to, co robił Jezus. Perform miracles every day, multiply bread and... Czyjcie cyba się tego dnia, rozdawajcie chleb. Walk on water. Chodźcie po wodzie. Raise people from the dead. Strzeszajcie umarłych. That's all you have to do. To jest jedyne, co musicie robić. How many people here believe you can do that? Both hands. Yeah, everyone. Oh, yes. See, that's this. This is the problem we're running into today. We believe we're just like the rest of the secular world. And we're not. And the more you read the Bible, <coughs> the more you're around holy people, you get to understand we can do everything that Jesus did. I was a Catholic pagan for the first 27 years of my life. I, I knew about God because I went to Catholic school. But I never had a relationship with God. It was an intellectual relationship. And that's boring. You have no faith, you expect nothing. And I met some people that actually knew Jesus. I used to hear things like that from Protestants in the United States, but I never heard it from Catholics. But when I was 27, I had a conversion experience, and people told me about a personal relationship with Jesus. And these Catholics talked about Jesus like they actually knew him. I was amazed. And then they prayed with me for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. In my experience of God, I went from here to here. Radically changed everything I thought about God. And I realized reading the Bible wasn't an intellectual exercise. It's the way we get faith. It tells us in the Word that faith comes by reading and hearing the Word of God. Faith what? Not faith just to believe in God, but faith that we are sons and daughters of God. Ale w to, że my jesteśmy synami i córkami Boga. And we have all the rights that Jesus Christ had from the Father. I że mamy te wszystkie przywileje i prawa, które miał Jezus Chrystus od Ojca. That means all the miracles that Jesus did, we can do. Także te wszystkie cuda, które Jezus czynił, my też możemy czynić. That's the good news. I to jest dobra nowina. That's what good news means. I to jest to właśnie, co znaczy. This is good stuff. To są dobre rzeczy. See, I like anything that's for free. If you tell me something for free, I, I'll take it, I'll take it. And the, and the Bible says, this is all free gift. See, the word salvation doesn't mean just going to heaven. Salvation also means healing, deliverance, freedom. 
Zbawienie oznacza także uzdrowienie, uwolnienie, wolność. Now, if you, if you read the Acts of the Apostles, I've seen every miracle that is in the Acts of the Apostles. I haven't walked on water except when it's frozen. But I've seen every other miracle. I've seen the multiplying of bread. I've seen every every disease healed that you can think of. I've seen prison raised from the dead. Can you repeat all these Every miracle. I've seen the food multiplied. I've seen healings of every kind of sickness. And I've seen someone raised from the dead. It's for all of us. I'm perfect proof. I was no, I, I, had, I was a, a poor Catholic. I wasn't an evil person, but I was a poor cat. And yet he's, I've seen every miracle that it's written in the Bible. I'm sure there's one or two good people here. So you should, you should see even more than what I've seen. And it's free. Free. You say, Vince, Vince, no, you won't. God has a wonderful life for us. We have to believe it. The devil has been lying to us for years and years and years in the Catholic Church. Don't listen to him anymore. Listen to Jesus. And do, like Mary said, do whatever he tells you to do. Amen. Amen.